This week what we're going to look at is the Enlightenment. And last week we looked at this scientific revolution, which is about how people started to look at the natural world in a different way. Uh, this week the Enlightenment is actually about turning inward and starting to look at the human mind and how people set up their social groups and so on. The Enlightenment stretches from the late 1600s, from the time of Isaac Newton, up through the end of the 1700s. And the people who joined this movement called themselves the Enlightened Ones. Um, we'll see what they called themselves in France was called the Philosophes, or Philosophers. Um, England was the first place where you've got the Enlightenment starting. And as again, uh, I had mentioned uh, at the end of the Scientific Revolution that Isaac Newton was really responsible for this. Um, his ideas inspired a man named John Locke, and John Locke started to study the human mind. Now, as I just mentioned, that the scientific revolution was about the study of the natural world. The Enlightenment period was a study of the human mind, and in 1690, John Locke published an essay called Essay Concerning Human Understanding, and what he was trying to do is figure out how the human mind actually worked, and according to him, when a person's born, the human mind is totally blank. So there's nothing there, and the way that the mind is filled with things is through the senses. So you've got sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. And his essay was really one of the foundational documents for the Enlightenment during this period. So you've got his ideas that the human mind is blank. Now, as I put up here on the slide, you can tell this doesn't leave room for the spiritual side of things. So the Enlightenment is another branch away or another step away from the Protestant Reformation and the break, the breakup of the Catholic Church. So you've got the scientific uh, revolution coming after that when people started questioning what the church had to say about the, the natural world. And now you've got another step away, which is the Enlightenment, where people are starting to think about the human mind and how things work. I've given you here a bit of um, Locke's essay, an essay concerning human understanding, and what I'd like you to do is to stop the video and click on the tag above so you can read a little more of this particular essay. Another person who is involved in sort of the foundation movement of the Enlightenment is a man named Montanescu, and he was in the French Parliament. And he was really interested not so much in the way the mind works, but in the way that social groups end up working. And he is really the founder of we would, what we would call political science and the science of sociology. Um, he started to look at how governments were formed. So how you, what are the foundational qualities of an absolutism form of government or a constitutional monarchy? And as I put up here on the slide, uh, Montanescu definitely liked um, constitutional monarchy from England more than he liked his own government. Probably one of the most important people of the Enlightenment is Voltaire. And as I mentioned just a little bit earlier, those who are involved in the Enlightenment movement in France are called philosophes, or the Enlightened Ones in, in France. Um, he has a really interesting history. So his father wanted him to be a lawyer, and he decided that he didn't want to do that and he wanted to be a writer, so he started to write. Now, sometimes his writing got him in trouble. So he wrote about a, a family in France and they didn't like what he had to say, and what they ended up doing is having him um, imprisoned in the Bastille, which is a, a political prison. And we'll look more at the Bastille when we look at the French Revolution. Um, anyway, he was put into prison and he was released a year later, but the condition was that he had to go into exile. So he ended up going to England. And when he was in England, he learned quite a bit about the English form of government, which of course is the constitutional monarchy. He ended up going back to France and he wrote another book that sort of got him in trouble. And this was called The Philosophical Letters on the English. And this seemed like sort of a, a safe topic because what he did was he was comparing the English government, constitutional monarchy, to the Roman government. However, it wasn't really the Roman government he was talking about, it was the French government. So it was really a veiled attack on his own government. And of course, they, they didn't like that, and they issued an arrest warrant for him. 
Um, he was also involved with a woman who was extremely influential in the, in the Enlightenment, and her name is Emily de Châtelet. Um, it's unclear what their relationship was. Um, Emily was married to someone else, and Voltaire ends up living in their, their mansion, working pretty closely with Emily. Now, she, as I said, she was extremely important in the Enlightenment. What she ended up doing is translating Newton's um, principles of mathematics and giving these to Voltaire. And so Voltaire ended up reading the French version of, of this, and he ended up writing a book that really brought the Enlightenment movement to France, and that was Elements of Newton's Philosophy. So Emily had a really big um, part in this. There are a couple of other things that Voltaire did to move the Enlightenment forward. Um, I'm going to go out of order of my slide here. I want to talk about Candide, or a book um, sometimes translated Optimism, written in 1759. What had happened is that there was a big earthquake in Portugal, and people in general were saying that God created the earth, and therefore it's perfect, so you don't really have to do anything to improve on um, your condition or improve the world. And after this earthquake, Voltaire didn't believe that at all. So what Candide, about, what Candide is about is that people should always be working to improve themselves and improve the world. And speaking of improving themselves, uh, you also have another um, uh, thing that happened in France called the Calais Affair. And you've got John Calais. Now, he was from a Protestant family, and the rumor is that he was trying to convert to Catholicism and that he had a big fight with his family. Um, one day, his father walked into the family barn and found John Calais hanging um, from the ceiling. Uh, the police were called, and the government blamed John Calais' father for killing, killing his son because he wanted to become Catholic. Um, what the French government ended up doing was torturing the father. And in the end, the father never said he killed his son. And Voltaire heard about this. And the, the next thing that happened is that the government ended up strangling the father, John Calais. So he never said he killed his son, never said he committed a crime, but the government ended up strangling him anyway. So Voltaire heard about this and, and sort of exposed this. And what this led to is the French government passing some laws saying they wouldn't torture their citizens. So Voltaire is really important in terms of like what we would call human rights today. On the next two slides, or on these slides, I've got um, part of his letters that he wrote, the philosophical letters on the English. So what I'd like you to do is to stop the video, read through this, um, and I will pop a tag up in case you want to read more of this. And the following slide, which is changing now, is a bit more of that particular letter. Another important movement that came out of the Enlightenment period is a religious movement called Deism. And deism is actually really interesting, and lots of famous people during this period were involved in this particular religious movement, like Thomas Jefferson, and of course Voltaire, who we were just um, talking about. Now deism is interesting because what it does is it strips away all sort of the miracle stories that you find in Christianity. So as I put here on the slide, it's a rational religion based on the observation of nature, so you, you have to use your senses to understand religion. So if there's something that happens that you can't use your senses for like a miracle story, then the deist thought that it wasn't true. And I've given you here the three roots of deism. So everything we know about um, the world comes from the senses. There's also uh, something called an argument by design, which states that um, God created the, the world at the very beginning of time, and it's very complicated, so it must have been put together by this deity. So argument by design is that the design is really complicated, so therefore there was a designer. And occasionally you still hear, hear this argument in religious circles. There's also this idea that um, was put forth by Newton, who said that when God created the world, he wound it up like a clock and then let it go. So that God doesn't have anything to do with the world after it's been created. So he winds it up and it ticks, it ticks down. Now, deism is really interesting, because I just mentioned that it denies all miracle stories. 
Deism also rejects the divinity of Jesus, which is really interesting. And it also rejects the idea that there is divine authority found in the Bible. So there's lots of things that we would associate with Christianity today that the deists did not um, believe in. Deism was part of the Enlightenment movement because it um, believed in religious toleration. So people should be able to uh, believe what they want to without fear of persecution. So deism has a really big part to play in the Enlightenment movement. And I put here a picture of Thomas Paine. He was um, what, an early deist, and as I mentioned, so was Voltaire, and so was um, Thomas Jefferson. I just mentioned that the deists were big and believing about religious toleration, and this had a direct impact on the formation of our own country. Um, what I've given you here is a bit of Amendment 1 of the Bill of Rights. And remember I said that Thomas Jefferson was directly involved in deism. Um, why don't you stop the video and read through the Amendment 1, and I will also pop a tag up so you can read the rest of this. I've been mentioning that Thomas Jefferson was a deist, and I don't know if you know this, but he actually wrote his own Bible, or sort of rewrote the Bible, and it's called the Jefferson Bible. Um, you can stop the, the video here, and what you're looking at is I've crossed out the parts that he took out. So he literally took a pen knife and chopped out a bunch of the Bible. And I will also pop a tag up, so if you want to read the rest of his version of the Bible, you can do that. And I've given you a bit more of the text in the next slide as well. You also find during the Enlightenment period the first movement to actually write down all of human knowledge. And this was started by a man named Diderot, and I've given you his dates here. Um, he actually wrote a book called the Encyclopedia, or he edited a book. And what he did was he asked all of these people that we've been talking about and others that I haven't mentioned who are involved in the Enlightenment movement to write down what they were learning about and what they were uh, teaching. And this becomes the very first encyclopedia. You also have other people who were starting to write about governments. Um, one is Rousseau, and I've mentioned Rousseau before, and I've just noted here that he was also a deist. So he thought that humans were actually good, but that sometimes if you get a bad government, it can corrupt them. Now, Rousseau believed that democracy was the best form of government. And if you remember, we talked about Rousseau before when I mentioned the social contract, where Rousseau said that he believes in the social contract, which is where a group of people give away their power to one person and that power then protect, or that person then protects them. The idea for Rousseau is that this social contract can be changed. So if people didn't like the form of government that they chose, they can, they can change that. You also have Immanuel Kant, and if you've taken any type of philosophy classes, you've heard of these people. He wrote a book called What is the Enlightenment? And he believed in the social contract as well, but he thought that once people chose the government, then they should be able to, or they should stick with that. So they shouldn't be able to change their government. It's probably no big surprise that reading actually increased, or literacy rates actually increased in the Enlightenment. Um, there were a couple of reasons for this. One is that the newspaper became much more popular. So if, in the past, if you wanted to hear the news, you went into like a coffee shop and someone would actually read the newspaper. Now people have a little more income and literacy rates go up and then people want to hear about what their governments are doing or just local news. You also have the rise of the novel, which I'm not really going to talk about here, but there are other places where you'd hear about these enlightenment ideas. One is a salon, which I've talked about before. That's where uh, people are invited into living rooms, and then you discuss these different ideas. You can also talk about the Enlightenment or hear about the Enlightenment in coffee shops. And the other place where you'd find this information being dispersed is in the Masonic Lodges. These Masonic Lodges are groups of men who got together. They're usually in the same um, employment, doing the same things. And what they would do is the exact same thing. They would get together and talk about Voltaire's 
ideas on government or Rousseau and so on. Um, this is also the time when you get lending libraries because not everyone could afford all of these new books or the newspapers. So we can sort of thank the Enlightenment period for the fact that we have libraries today where you can go in and borrow a book for free and you just have to promise to return it. The three main ideas that I want to talk about in terms of what was being discussed during the Enlightenment period, um, especially in place of these or in, in the salons, one is the difference between Europeans and non-Europeans. I also want to mention a little bit about the discussion of slavery. And then the last idea that was fairly popular during the Enlightenment was the difference between men and women. All right, in terms of the differences between Europeans and non-Europeans, this discussion goes back um, before the time period of our class to the 1500s when Europeans had discovered Central and South uh, and North America. And you've got two sides to this. One, uh, which is put forth by uh, Lacassus, who said that European non-Europeans were fully human and therefore they really couldn't be used as slaves. You've got another man named Sepulveda who believed that these people were subhuman. And of course, these arguments had a big influence on what happens later, which is slavery, because the Pope comes out and says that the people living on this side of the world are fully human and they cannot be used as slaves. So then the Europeans ended up going to Africa and stealing a bunch of people from there. Um, you also have discussions on the nature of European versus Americans. So you've got a, a, a person named Abe Reynal, and he ends up writing a book, and I've given you the title here, The Philosophy, or Philosophical History and Politics of the Two Indies. Um, in that book, what he says is the New World in North America, um, in the New World, people are smaller and dumber, and they have um, smaller brains, and the animals, too, in North America are much smaller than anything that um, lives in Europe. And he claimed it was because of the weather. He said, in North America, it's cold and gloomy all the time, therefore things are stunted. And of course, this made a lot of people in North America upset. Uh, Benjamin Franklin um, ended up going to France to do some discussions about um, the American Revolution that was um, coming up. And Benjamin Franklin was really loved in France. And he went to a state dinner at one point, and Abbe Reynal happened to be there. And Reynal started talking about his ideas about how puny Americans were. And so what Benjamin Franklin did is he told all the North Americans to stand up at the table, and they did, and then he told everyone else to stand up. And you can probably guess what happened. All the North Americans towered over the Europeans. And Benjamin Franklin um, got Abbe Reynal to uh, take back what he said. And of course, I've put up here a little quote. Benjamin Franklin said that Abbe Reynal was, was a mere shrimp when compared to North Americans. And Thomas Jefferson also got involved in this, where he said, you know, there are mammoths that were living in North America, and these are certainly bigger than anything found in Europe, at least according to him at that point. Um, so this discussion between European and non-European was actually um, really interesting. The issue of slavery was another topic that was being discussed during the Enlightenment period. And of course, this is right in the middle of the big slave period where you've got Europeans grabbing Africans from Africa and then bringing them over to do all of the, the labor. So I've given you here a list of who supported and who sort of rejected it. So Hobbes and, Locke, Hobbes and Locke both said that slavery was part of the natural human condition and that there wasn't anything that can be done because it was done in the past and will probably be done in the future. Voltaire sort of said the same thing, um, that it was a part of our human past and therefore it was very difficult to get rid of. Uh, Montesquieu totally rejected the idea of slavery. And what's really interesting, I've given you here a quote from Thomas Jefferson, and this should sound familiar. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. Um, Thomas Jefferson was probably writing this at his desk with his slaves bringing him his tea and his um, coffee and his dinner. So it's a weird irony that the person who wrote the Declaration of Independence and other documents in the foundation of this country um, had slaves. The last issue I want to talk about in terms of what was discussed during the Enlightenment period was the difference between men and women. 
Um, and this was a pretty hot topic because, as I mentioned, women were definitely involved in the Enlightenment period, but were treated um, much worse than the men were treated. So Daniel Defoe, now he came out and said that men and women were equal. The reason that they were not equal during his time period, he said, is because of education. So women were not given an education, and if they were, then they would be, and at least in terms of intellectual equals, to men. Um, Descartes and Locke both said they were equal. You've got Diderot and Voltaire who, they, they said women were essentially equal too, but it was the whole idea of education again. So again, women did not receive an education and therefore they weren't um, intellectual equals to men, but if they could get the education, they would be equal. In these next two slides, I've given you a fairly big chunk of text, um, which is Daniel Defoe's The Education of Women. What I'll do is I will pop a tag up so that you can uh, stop the video and read this either here on the screen or read it at the website that I will give you. There were certainly other people who didn't believe that women were equal. Uh, Rousseau believed that they should stay at home, uh, that they couldn't think rationally, and because of that, they should definitely not be involved in politics. You also have another person named Roussel, and he wrote a book called The Physical and Moral Makeup of Women. And in this book, what he said is that the nervous systems of women, the brain size of women, are totally different from men, and therefore they are naturally different. Now, of course, lots of women disagreed with this. Um, one famous one was Mary Wollstonecraft, and she wrote the Vind A Vindication of the Rights of Women. And what I'll do is I will put up a tag to this very important document, and what I'd like you to do is to stop the video, open up the website, and read through some of what Mary Wollstonecraft has to say. She essentially says that people should be giving women an education, and when they get an education, they are going to be equal to men. And this is our last slide for this lecture. I just wanted to point out a few trends that we're seeing. So during the scientific revolution, I mentioned this before, people were looking at the natural world and they were using their human senses and reason to figure out what was happening. And this was a step away from what the Catholic Church was telling people the way that the, uh, the world was. You've got, during the Enlightenment, people turned inward and started looking at how the human mind works and how human groups work. So you get new sciences, political science, psychology, and sociology. And another outcome of the, of the Enlightenment was that people started to question their government. So when their government did something bad, they wanted to, to write about it. And of course, this is where you get the influence of newspapers becoming uh, very important. So again, the Enlightenment is just one step further away from what happened during the Protestant Reformation, which is when the Catholic Church broke up and people felt the freedom to start thinking and talking about things that they couldn't do before.